good morning, church, and happy Mother's Day. It's such a great day, such a special day, and uh, welcome back. We're in a great series. We're in a great series called Leverage, and I love, I love this series, and God has been teaching us and challenging us of what it means to live life for the fullness and for the glory of God and really make the most of the opportunities we've been given. And so we were talking about this. How do we leverage the things that are in our lives? Now, the definition of leverage that we're using is this. It says to use something to maximum advantage, to use something to maximum advantage. And so we've talked about how do we use our time to maximum advantage. If you missed two weeks ago, I encourage you to go back and watch the podcast because I believe God spoke in a powerful way to us about the time that he's entrusted us. We always want more time, but we, what are we doing with the time we've been given? Last week, Pastor Brandon did a great job talking about our education. How do we use our education for the glory of God? You know, we live in one of the most educated places in the world. There are a lot of degrees sitting in this place right now. How do we leverage that? What do we do with that? Today, we're gonna talk about resources. How do we leverage the resources that have been entrusted to us? And then next week, our difficulties. How do we leverage the difficulties and the hurt and the pain, the struggles that we face for the glory of God? How do we leverage those? And then we'll talk about our platform and how do we leverage the platform that God has given each one of us? You know, it was Archimedes, the ancient Greek philosopher, mathematician who said, you give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I will move the world. And it's so true. I mean, you think about it, there's the power of that. And we can leverage what God has given us to impact the people around us and really to change the world for the glory of God. The power of God working in us and through us. And we get one shot at this life, guys. We get one opportunity. We get, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this earth, and that's it. What are we doing with what we've been given? And may God find us faithful. If you have a Bible with you today, I invite you up with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Now, if you don't have a Bible, there's some Bibles in the back. Love for you to take one. It's yours, a gift from us. Put your name in it. It's, it's yours. Uh, also, we'll put the words on the screen. And then if you have a mobile device, you can access the scripture at version and follow along with what God's word has to say. But Matthew, first book, New Testament, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the gospels talk about Jesus and his ministry, his teaching, and then his death, his burial, his resurrection, which we just celebrated at Easter. Praise be to God, the new life we have in Christ. But we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25. We're going to pick up here in verse 14. And you notice these are red letters. This is the, the very words of Jesus. And so it says again, now, we got to look at the context, right? Because a lot of times we take passages out of context. But if you look at the context, Jesus is teaching about heaven, right? This is called the Olivet Discourse, right? I mean, this is Jesus' teaching right before he's arrested and taken to be crucified and resurrected. So he's teaching there about the kingdom of heaven and what it's going to be like when, when he returns the second time. So he says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Now, your translation may say talents, right? A talent was a, a way that they used to, to exchange money. It was a talent of money. It could be also kind of thought about as talents or gifts or resources. But he's going on this journey, so he gives five bags of gold to one servant, two bags to another, and then one, each according to their ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went at once. Now, if you underline your Bible, underline at once, because he went at once. He didn't think of excuses. He didn't debate. He just went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of these servants returned and settled accounts with them. The underline returned because he's coming back, right? It wasn't like the master's low and here you go, I'm leaving, I'm never coming back. No, I'm going on a journey, I'm coming back and he returned. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant exclamation point, right? I mean, he's excited. I love exclamation points, right? And here it is. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 
Then the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrust me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. Great. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. (laughs) Underline that. I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant, exclamation point. That's pretty strong, isn't it? He goes from good and faithful servant to you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I had not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, you would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside in the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. But here's what Jesus says. Hey, you have resources. You've been entrusted with them. So what are you gonna do with them? If you have a place, you could take notes today. There's a place in, on your worship guide. Here's some things I'd love for you to write down. How do we leverage the resources God has given us? How do we leverage these resources. Notice, first of all, realize all the resources that God has entrusted to us. Sometimes we think, well, I just don't have that much. I just have a little, oh, start to think bigger today. Realize everyone has something, right? You notice this first guy, he gets five bags of gold, but the next guy gets two bags, but the next guy gets one bag, but everybody gets something. So often we think, well, I don't have really anything, right? I didn't get anything. I don't really have gifts, talents, abilities, resources. All these other people have so much, though everybody has something. Also notice, right, everything they had came from the master. Did you notice that? Sometimes we think, well, it was my hard-earned money or it was my, you know, resources or I built this or I did this, you know. And you gotta go, wait, wait, wait a minute. Where did we even get the opportunity to do that? <laughs> Why are we even born in the United States of America? All right, why do we have the opportunity to have the education we have? How did I inherit this money or whatever it is in your life? You know, we go on mission trips to Moldova and you go and you work with these kids there, the poorest, smallest country in the former Soviet Union, some of the most beautiful children you've ever met. And one of our transitional living kids said, you know, Pastor Jeff, he said, I, I can work here in Moldova. I can work a 12 hour day and I can make $10. He goes, but in America, I could go and make $10 for one hour at McDonald's. <laughs> and you just say, wow, there's a little perspective, right? But everybody has something and everything comes from the master. Hey, everyone receives resources. Do you know this? According to his or her ability. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. We all have this ability and God entrusts that to us. And he says, okay, you've got these resources now. What are you going to do with them? How are you going to leverage them? And you've got the ability to put those into practice, to use those for the glory of God. Here's the thing. Don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you do have. We live in a society right now, right? We spend all of our time on Instagram or on Facebook, on social media, and we're always like, well, how are they going on another vacation? What do they get, like eight weeks off a year? I mean, what is going on? Like, I mean, they just went to Disney World. I mean, come on, like, how are they doing this? And then we kind of look at, oh, I don't have anything. Right, I mean, like, they're always gone. They're always doing this. Look, they got a new car, they got a new house, they got a new outfit. How'd they get a new outfit? I don't know, but we compare ourselves. You know what comparison does? just leads us to depression, right? I don't have anything compared to all these other people. But let me give you a little perspective today. I went on global rich list at an annual salary of $32,400 a year. Think about family income, $32,400 a year. I know there's people in this room make more or less, but listen, just at that salary a year, you're in the top 1%. 
1% of the wealthiest people in the entire world. Let that sink in for just a moment, okay? Every one of us, just by virtue of where we live, just by virtue of the resources and trust us, we're the person with the five bags of gold. So what are we doing with what we have been given? Guys, think about all the things. Think about all the things that God has entrusted to you. I mean, yeah, he's entrusted resources. He's entrusted money. He's entrusted a house. He's entrusted, you know, a car. He's entrusted an education. He's entrusted to you a children, family. He's entrusted to you opportunities. He's entrusted to you, get this one, his Holy Spirit. All right, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, God places in you when you become a Christ follower. God has given you a lot of resources, a lot of resources. So that leads us to number two. What you do with the resources, what are you doing with the resources that God has entrusted to you matters to God. What you do with the resources God entrusted to you matters to God. Notice that he goes on this journey, right? The master goes on the journey, but the master returns. And he brings all the servants back. He says, hey, guys, come here, come here, come here. Show me what you've done. We have a responsibility to invest what is entrusted to us. Some people think, well, I just have all this and it's just for me. (laughs) I can go build bigger things for me. I can build bigger bars for me. And you're just like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing with what you've been given? I, I love new believers. And we have a, our church, we have a lot of people who've been walking with the Lord for a long time, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. It's awesome, man, just to see us serve together. But I love that you're always inviting people to church and people are coming and they're hearing about Jesus and their lives are being changed. And new believers, they'll come up and they'll just go, I am so excited. I can't believe that Jesus died for me. What do I do? And, and you're like, oh, okay, worship one, serve one. You know, worship one hour, serve one. Great, I'm in. What do you want me to do? Put me in, right? Put me in, coach, because... They're just fired up. They're just like, okay, well, you need to read your Bible. Great, tell me where to start. Okay, well, get the Rolling Hills app. There's a daily step. Like, great, I'll do it, you know? I mean, they're so excited. Get a Bible study. Okay, where do I start? Because they're just pumped up, you know? And you're like, well, you're supposed to give your first 10% back to God. Okay, that's a great deal, man. You mean, you mean I get to keep 90%? I give 10% back to God? Yeah, you know, that's like, and they're just excited because they're thinking, man, look what God's done. But do you know, statistically, the more money you make, the less you give. Now, isn't that odd? You would think the more I make, the more I'm gonna give, but, but then statistically go and look at it. And here's how it works, right? Because you go, oh, wow, I made $100. I can give $10 to God, no big deal. I made $1,000, I can give $100 to God, yeah, that's good. I made $100,000, I can give $10,000 to God, nah, that's a lot. Right here, I'm going to give $2,000 to God. God, that's pretty big. That's $2,000. God's like, really? I just gave you $100,000, really? But that's what we do. That's the mentality. When we get older, we're like, oh, we're getting toward retirement. I can just kick it back. I don't have to do anything. You're like, you got wisdom. You got experience. You jump in. This is your time. You're like, ah. All of a sudden you got a bigger house and you got a free bedroom and you're like, you can use that bedroom. You know, invite somebody over to let an intern stay there, you know, adopt or foster or have somebody come. You've got a house and the resources. I, uh. But for us to keep that joy and to say, no, I want to use that. I want to use what's entrusted to me. Invest your resources in what brings eternal returns. Guys, there's three things that are eternal, right? God, God's word, And people, those are the three things. Everything else, we're not taking with us. Everything else is staying here. I mean, here today, it's gone tomorrow, but the things that are gonna last. And so are we investing in the things that are eternal? Are you investing your resources in the things that matter? You think about it, you got the five bags, right? Are you investing it in the things that matter? Because there will be judgment over how we invest the resources entrusted to us. We we don't think about that a lot, right? We don't think about it. It's just like, oh, God, you know, he wound up the world. He kind of backs away. And he's like, hey, do whatever you want. No, 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 no. There's there's accountability that comes, right? There's an accountability that comes with how we use the resources we are given. 
They all stood before the master one day. The guy who had five, the guy who had two, the guy who had one. Everybody stood before the master one day. This is important, but when we die, there'll be two judgments. I think a lot of people get confused on this, right? But there's actually two judgments that the Bible talks about. The, the first judgment we'll stand before God is this, it's salvation. What did you do with Jesus Christ? And every one of us is gonna have to give an answer. Every one of us, right? As God was drawing you to himself, did you say, yes, 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 I wanna follow Jesus. I wanna be a Christ follower. Or did you reject, say no. It's not your parents' faith, your church's faith, it's yours. What did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? Every person who ever lived, we're gonna have to give an answer to this question. But here's the second one, right? It's sanctification. What did you do with what you were given? Okay, so we'll stand before God one day. What did you do with Jesus Christ? And it says, he'll separate the sheep from the goats. Then he's gonna turn to the sheep and say, hey, what did you do with what you were given? What did you do? How did you use it? The things that I had trusted to you. If you keep going here in Matthew 25, he actually talks about this. And Jesus keeps going. And he says in verse 37, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? When, when did we do that? When did we take care of of you and the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You did for me. When you take care of the poor or the hurting or the broken, when you, when you realize I have a lot of clothes and I can give those to people who are in need, when you look around and meet those needs, you, you do that for him. The apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter three, Verse 11, he says, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. <laughs> the fulcrum, right? He, he's the fulcrum, he, we are the lever. How do we lever that? He is the foundation. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their works will be shown for what it is because the day, now notice that, day is capitalized, right? That's judgment day because there's a day that will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, right? So this is the second judgment. The first judgment, right, is about what did you do with Jesus Christ? The second, what did we do with what we were given? And it'll go through the fire and the things that are last are the things that are eternal. And then there'll be rewards given. And you can go in the book of Revelation and talks about rewards and, and, and you know, we'll be given crowns. And now I don't believe we're gonna all walk around with these giant crowns because some of you are gonna have the, these huge crowns. I'm gonna have like this little crown, you know, but we're all gonna be here. We're gonna do that, right? We're gonna take these crowns. We're gonna lay them at the feet of Jesus, okay? So we're all on the same level when we're there in heaven. But there will be an accountability. I mean, Jesus is making it really clear. Hey, one day, one day, we're gonna stand before God. One day we will. Okay, so are you investing your God-given resources in building your kingdom or God's kingdom? I mean, we're top 1%, okay? Most of us in this room, are we using what God has given us? So we ought to be able to further God's kingdom in an incredible way. So here we go. What are you doing with the resources you've been given? I mean, did you evaluate, did you think about your life what are you doing with the resources you will be given? If you don't use your God-given resources, then you'll lose them. You know, it, Jesus says, hey, take the bag of gold from him, the one who has one, who buried it, who didn't do anything with it, and give it to the one who has 10. And we're thinking, but that's not fair. That's not really nice. I mean, come on, everybody gets a trophy, right? Right, participation trophy, right? Every, and Jesus is like, no. No, I mean, for all of us in here, if you have a financial advisor and they lose your money every single year, you're not sticking with them, are you? You're like, so sorry, see you, buddy. I'm going to the one who has 10, who's done really well, who's succeeded, I'm, I'm going over there. Yeah, that's right, that makes sense. So if you have these resources, you don't use them, he's like, you're gonna lose out. But also notice this, if you invest the resources for God's glory, it'll be multiplied. 
it'll be multiplied. Now, I love this. I mean, you think about the, the guy who had five and then all of a sudden he's got 10 and then all of a sudden he's got 11. I mean, it just like keeps being multiplied. Guys, that's church. That's community. You know, we just had a mission team come back from the Amazon. And they were on a boat going up and down the Amazon, sharing Christ in different villages and, and doing ministry in the village and taking care of the, the poor and the orphan and the forgotten and getting back on the boat, sleeping in hammocks and waking up in a, in a village the next day and, and serving there. But you know what, guys? That took all of us. We started a nonprofit 10 years ago called Justice and Mercy, Mercy International. And guys, that's us. That's us going to serve. That's us going to, together. Some people can go. They, they took their vacation to go. Some people can't go, but they can stay and pray and they can give. But it's all of us. That's how it's multiplied. Last week, there was a group of seniors that filled this stage. But it took all of us. Some of you taught them in preschool, some in children, some in students. Some were with them a long time. There were parents. There's grandparents. There's a church who's, who puts in money to build facilities and to take care of them. That's all of it. That's how it's multiplied. And isn't that beautiful? That's the body of Christ together. I love that. That's how you go, hey, look, we were part of something for your glory, God. You know, today is Mother's Day and, and I'm so thankful for all the moms here. I gotta tell you, thank you. Thank you. Proverbs 31 says this, <laughs> Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. And you know, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about moms, the impact that you have. You, you just make such an impact, such a difference. My mom, I love my mom. So thankful for my mom. She's part of our church. And you know, my, my mom and my dad, they had two kids. So there was me and my sister. And then, then we got married. And so then all of a sudden my mom, there's four of us there, you know, with my dad, there were six of us there. And then, and then we had kids. And so then my mom's got five grandkids, you know, and there they are, five grandkids. And now my niece is getting married in two weeks. And then all of a sudden, this little group becomes a bigger group. And you're just like, just keeps being multiplied. And you know, you just think about that, how it just continues to grow. And moms, when you pour into your kids, you're impacting generations. You're impacting people who aren't even born yet. But as you lead them to the Lord, as you pray for them, as you encourage them, as you pour into them, I'm telling you, it's incredible. And God says, hey, I haven't trusted you. And it's great if your kids can kick a soccer ball, praise God, but I want them to be godly. I want them to know Jesus. I want them to walk with me because that's gonna impact so many others. Mm. So here's the question. Are you living by fear or are you living by faith? Are you living by fear? Oh, God can't use me. I'm gonna go bury my talent. I'm gonna bury my gifts, right? God can't use me, I, you know what? Maybe when I, you know, get more knowledge than I'll teach or when I, you know, have more time than I'll serve or, or, or when I make more money than I'll give and I'll be generous and I'll see needs around me and I'll help out. When, no, 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 stop living by fear, live by faith. Live by faith. God has entrusted this to me. I get one shot at it. Let me use it all for the glory of God. Now notice this, the aim of your life is to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Guys, as your pastor, I, I long for you. I long for that day. Every one of us stands before God. He's just like, well done. Well done, Rolling Hills Community Church. Well done, good and faithful servant. You didn't miss it. You invested it for my name and for my glory. You used this life to further my kingdom, make a difference in the lives of lots of others. Well done. That's the aim of your life. You know, if the aim of your life is not simply to make a lot of money, that's what the world's gonna tell us, right? It's about making more money and more money and more money. No, no, no. Why? Because it's never enough. The aim of our life is to please God. The aim of our life is to please God. Notice that God doesn't say perfect servant, <laughs> but faithful servant. Well done, good. And you're thinking, well, I'm not good. 
Oh, but if you're in Christ, you are. You know why? It's called imputed righteousness. Great theological word. It means this, that God imputes the righteousness of Christ. And so when God looks at you, he doesn't see all your mess ups, your mistakes. He looks and says, hey, you are good. And it doesn't say, yeah, I'm perfect. No, it just says, be faithful, good and faithful. I'm gonna run the race to the end. I'm not gonna stop. I'm following Jesus all the days of my life. When I was in college, there was a guy who started a Bible study and his name was Louis Giglio. He started a study on our campus and, uh, and the study kind of blew up. So uh, for four years, it just kind of grew and grew and grew. We had a couple of thousand students coming to this Bible study on Monday nights. And then from there, it kind of launched this whole kind of movement called Passion. And this Passion movement happened and all of a sudden, like in, you know, there was Austin, Texas and Fort Worth. But then in Memphis, in the year 2000 in Memphis, there was a it was a gathering of college students, tens of thousands of college students who came from all over to Memphis. And it was just this outdoor Shelby Farms, college students everywhere. And there was a guy named John Piper who spoke and, and he spoke and, and I wanna tell you, these seven minutes really impacted an entire generation of Christian college students. And here's what he said that day. He said, guys, I wanna tell you, there's people who spend billions of dollars to tell you to live for the American dream to make the pursuit of your life to be light, to have a nice little house and a nice little car and a nice little family and then to retire and die. Yeah, that's what the American dream, right? To be comfortable, to be safe. He said, but I wanna tell you, I want the aim of your life to be lived for the glory of God. God's got a bigger dream for you than that. Don't waste your life. And then he told the story about Ruby Eliza. Ruby Eliza was in his church and Ruby Eliza, she was single all of her life. And in her 60s and 70s, she started doing mission trips. And she would go to a place called Cameroon, right? And do ministry there with some of the poor and the orphan. And she just loved it. And everybody in the church just loved Ruby Eliza because she had this joy. And she was going and working there. And then a lady named Laura Edwards, she was a medical doctor. Her husband passed away and she was in her 80s. A medical doctor, and she said, hey, I want to go with you, Ruby. I want to go there. She went there. They were having the time of their life and serving and working in some of the poorest areas you've ever seen. And one day they're driving in their Jeep, and the brakes go out. They went over a cliff, and they died instantly. He says, do you think that's a tragedy? No, that's not a tragedy. He said, well, I'll tell you what a tragedy is. He pulled out Reader's Digest. Bob and Penny lived up in the Northeast, Bob, 59, Penny, 51. They retired early and moved to Florida where they have a small boat, they play softball and collect seashells. That's their life. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. For the best years of their life, for 30 years of their life, they're gonna go around and collect seashells and then they're gonna stand before God one day and go, God, here's my seashell collection? Really? You were created for so much more. Now it's fine to go to Florida and take a week's vacation and be renewed and refreshed, but get in the game. Live your life for the glory of God. Invest in the things that matter because God has entrusted so much to you. His name is Ben Macklemson. And Ben was a walk-on on the 2006 USC Trojans football team. He never thought he would make the team, a great football team, but he, he made it and he got on the team and he said, I knew that God had me on that team for a reason. Strong believer and said, hey, I wanna make a difference here on this team. So he started a Bible study and nobody came. He started a prayer group before the games, nobody came. That USC team was really good that year. In fact, they made the Rose Bowl. And they were gonna play in the Rose Bowl against Michigan, New Year's Day. And Ben was so discouraged because nobody was responding. He just felt like he was wasting the opportunity that he had. So he called his granddad and he said, granddad, what do I do? And his granddad, who was a Gideon said, you know what, God's word will never return void. You know what, your grandmother and I, we're gonna buy a hundred Bibles. We'll pay for it ourselves. We'll buy a hundred Bibles, we're shipping it to you. Give one to every teammate. And so on Christmas Day, Ben sat down and wrote a note to every one of his teammates with a Bible. He went in that night in the locker room and he put it in every one of their lockers. 
He came back the next day, December 26, and he thought, you know what, it's gonna be awesome. People are gonna be reading their Bibles. But when he walked in, what he saw was Bibles torn apart and covered the floor. And the blood just ran out of his body. He thought, oh, I've just wasted it all. Wasted it all. Until about four weeks later, the kicker on the team, they went on to win the Rose Bowl, and, but the kicker, Mario, was killed in a car wreck. And Ben went to the funeral, and when they were bringing the casket down the aisle, he looked over, and the Bible that he gave Mario was sitting on top of the casket. He looked at his teammate, and his teammate goes, yeah, you didn't know? Mario gave his life to Christ about a week after you gave him that Bible. He read that note, and he gave his life to Christ. Ben sat, just sat there and just wept. He's now, Ben's now on the staff of, with Pete Carroll and the Seattle Seahawks, and he just says, I want to use my life to lead people to Jesus. That's what's going to last. That's what's going to be there. So here's the question. If you were to look at your life today, if you were to evaluate your life right now, what would you hear God say? Not that you're perfect, nothing else, just God, what would you say? What do I need to change? What do I need to do? Who do I need to be for your name, for your glory? Jim Elliott said this, he is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. <laughs> what are you doing with what's entrusted to you? What are you doing to further God's kingdom? To make a difference in your family? To make a difference in your community? to make a difference for the glory of God. Oh God, find us faithful. I wanna ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. I don't know where you are today. Maybe if you were to look at your life, you'd just say, I've been living by fear. I've been living by fear. I know God's invited me into a relationship. I'm just scared to commit my life to Christ. I know God's called me to be baptized and I'm just scared. I know God's called me to serve and I, I'm just scared. Today, would you just say, God, no more fear. I want to live by faith. God, I want to live by faith. I want to trust you. I want to follow you. God, I'm yours. I want to pour into those around me. I want to love. I want to be generous. I want to be kind. So Father God, here we are, your disciples, your servants. God, you've entrusted every one of us with five bags. You've given us so much. And oh Lord, I pray that you would find us faithful. Don't let us settle for a lie. Don't let us buy into the American dream and just fall into consumerism and more and more and more stuff. God, let us be people who are generous. Let us be people who are faithful. Let us be people who love radically. God, we need you. God, we admit that, Father, we just compare ourselves to others instead of finding our worth and our value in you and what you say about us. And you say that we are loved. And you say that we are redeemed. And you say that we are enough. You say, God, that you are for us. And if you are for us, who could be against us? So God, open our eyes to your truth and to your love. And use us, oh God, to leverage the resources you've given us to further your kingdom. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen, amen.